All right, it's very good to see you all here. Thank you all for coming. Today we will learn something about latent class analysis, also known as LCA. Um, what we will learn today. Uh, so here is the agenda for today's talk. Uh, I will use the first 10 minutes to give us some uh, theor theoretical part about LCA. I will talk about what is LCA, uh, what kind of questions can be answered by LCA, and the difference between LCA and factor analysis. Then I will use the rest of the time to uh, illustrate an example of LCA step by step in the software M+. I'll end the talk uh, with some speed tips. Our first question is, what is LCA? LCA is a latent variable modeling approach. Um, it identifies unseen subgroups within a population using responses from a set of variables. So we need to pay special attention to unseen subgroups. Before I explain what is unseen subgroups, what is seen subgroups? I can easily divide you into men, men and women, just telling from your biological gender. But if I want to divide you into easygoing people versus not easygoing people, it's not easy for me, because I have to infer that from your behavior. But now I want to infer something, it's latent, it's unseen, it's unobservable. So LCA identifies latent classes from responses from a set of variables. Whenever it comes to classifying people, LCA is always a good option because the variables we use to identify, to classify people can be nominal, ordinal, or continuous. Then the next thing is, what are common applications of LCA? Um, here are just the sample um, situations we can use LCA. The first is we can uh, classify subgroups of students. I think Dr. Asher might be really interested to use that because for self-efficacy research, sometimes we want to classify students into overconfident students, just confident students, and less confident students. So we can have more investigation. Or in clinical settings, uh, we might be interested in to classify uh, our patients into general distress versus general well-being. Um, we can also use LCA for this purpose. The second situation is LCA could be used as a diagnostic test in clinical settings to assess the validity of scores from a cognitive assessment. Like if we have an assessment measuring distress and we have diagnosed this a group of people belongs to the distress group, then we can use LCA to classify the people and to see if that assessment indeed give a good result of who belongs to the distressed group. Then the third um, situation we can use LCA is um, when it's necessary to classify people into subgroups, but there's no gold rules for us. So in clinical, uh, classical test theory, we always use cut score. But sometimes cut score is not available. Like if you want to study study habits, study habits is not a latent continuum, and we can't have cut scores for that. If um, and we want to investigate if there are some self-regulators or procrastinators in our sample, we can use LCA. Or other cases, if we want to use outcome rating scale to measure. Um, uh, patients' general distress versus general well-being, if we don't have a cut score ready for us to use, we can also use LCA to classify people into different groups. The fourth situation is LCA could be used uh, when we have invalid respondents. When we have online surveys, respondents might fake their responses. Or lengthy surveys, respondents might be really honest at the beginning but dishonest at the end. Or obligatory surveys, they might just not interested in giving us honest opinion. Also, it can adjust for the noise caused by non-response buyers when we have a very, very low response rate. So LCA can apply both educational settings and the clinical settings. What are the specific questions that can be answered by LCA? Uh, here are some sample um, questions. The first question is, the most important and interesting by LCA is, are there different latent classes of students based on their responses to a set of items? 
The second question is, if we hypothesize that the participants in my sample can be grouped into two latent classes, how can we confirm this hypothesis? The third question is, if two latent classes are identified, what is the sample size per latent class? This question is really, really important, especially when we want to study invalid respondents. If there, I want to know the sample size of the invalid respondents so I can decide what to do with them. If I only have 1% of them, my sample, being invalid respondents, probably I will not be too worried. But if I have 20% of my sample being invalid respondents, I have to spend more efforts to deal with those people. I don't want them to mess up with my data. Then the fourth question, given someone's response pattern, what is the probability that a person belongs to a certain class? Now we talk about what is LCA, why LCA is important. The next question is, what is modeled in LCA? There is only one single variable that is modeled in LCA. It's called the latent classes variable. The latent classes variable is a categorical variable. Uh, the categories in the latent class being the um, types of classes. So I'll use this figure as an example. We use the five items to model LCA model and the latent classes being the single variable we'll model. And we identified this latent classes variable contains two categories. The first category is latent classes class one. The second category is latent class two. Then the response patterns in latent class one is students in latent class one have high probability endorsing items one and four, but low pr probability of endorsing items two, three, and five. Then for students in latent class two, they have high probability of endorsing items two, three, five, but low probability of endorsing items one and four. What does that tell us? It tells us two things. First, latent classes differ from each other based on the response patterns. The second is individuals in the same latent class have similar response patterns. You might be wonder, the figure on the top looks very similar to the factor analysis figure we used before. Then what is the difference between LCA and factor analysis? The most apparent and important difference is LCA classifies people, not items. So LCA is also called a people or person-centered approach, while FA is called a item-centered approach. Then the second difference between the two is when you model categorical latent variable, you're doing LCA. But when you, when you model a continuous latent construct, you're doing FA. The third difference between the two is the interest, why we want to use LCA or why we want to use FA. When they use LCA, we are not interested in to build a continuum or we are not interested in to find the internal structure of a scale. What we are interested in is to classify people. Once we have the group of people, we can decide if we want to do specific interventions toward these people. Like, if we find there are some procrastinators in our group, probably we can develop an intervention targeting this group of students. So I'll stop here for our theoretical review. Here is a brief summary of what we have learned. First, LC identifies unseen subgroups within population using responses from a set of variables. Then, when LCA can be used. LCA is commonly used when it's, when it's necessary to identify latent classes from a sample or a gold rule of classifying people. It's not readily available. The only variable model in LCA is the latent classes variable. Different from FA, LCA classifies people, not items. So, what are the basic steps we need to follow in order for us to conduct LCA in M plus? Um, in general, there are four steps we need to follow. Step one is identify LCA indicators. Step two is to estimate LCA models. It's, this step is very similar to the exploratory factor analysis or EFA before. 
um, for EF, we will start with one factor, then two factor, three factor. But for LCA, we'll start with two classes model, then three classes model, till the, um, the model become too complex to be useful. Uh, once we have all the LCA models ready, we can evaluate which model is the best solution to our data set. If we identified the best solution, we can interpret the LCA results related to that model. In the following slides, I will illustrate step by step and how to do that in M plus using an example. So step one, identify LCA indicators. So how can we determine the items or variables we want to use and make sense to our purposes? Uh, there are different ways. The first way is we can use existing instrument. So if I want to do a research on uh, if there are invalid respondents in my sample, I can go to the literature and find out uh, what variables can we use related to invalid responding. Or I can write a set of items for my purposes if I can't find any related to invalid responding. Or I can combine the two options and use them together. So here is an example. Um, suppose the researchers have a online survey marrying students' motivation. It took two hours to finish it. Researchers might be really interested to um, investigate the invalid respondents in the survey. So they have raised the question, do we have invalid respondents in online survey responses? Um, I created a fake data for us to use. After digging into the literature, I found out there are many, many indicators I can use for invalid responding. But I decided to use these five. Speedy, lying, careless, disabled, and extreme. Um, I will introduce them one by one. Uh, lying, I have told the truth on this survey with careless and disabled. These three statements are actually included in the survey. So participants will give a response to these three uh, statements. If a person said, yes, I have told the truth, then this person will have a low probability of being invalid. But if this person said, no, I didn't tell the truth, then this person will have a high probability of being invalid. Similarly, if a person said, yes, I was careless, then this person might have a high probability of being invalid. So we'll give this person a one. If this person said, no, I was not careless, I am careful, then we'll give a zero. For disabled, I have more than two types of disabilities. This is also called a bogus item because um, people who have more than two types of disabilities are very limited. And if a person says, yes, I have more than two types of disabilities, this person might have a high probability of being invalid. Versus a person said, no, I didn't have more than two types of disabilities, then this person will have a low probability of being invalid. I highlight, highlighted the first and the fifth variable in bold to raise your attention because these two variables are derived variables from existing information. Uh, speedy is related to the time finished in the survey, um, or average response time to an item. Uh, so like online uh, softwares for doing online service like Quadrix will provide us with a starting time point and ending time point. Use that information, we can calculate the average response time to each item. Based on literature, if it's less than three seconds, then we can uh, give, a zero, uh, give a one to this person, indicating this person might be invalid. If it's equal or greater than three seconds, we'll give this person a zero. Extreme, uh, we use the mean score of the other outcome variables, such as self-efficacy. If a person's mean score of self-efficacy ranked 99 percentile or higher, this person might have a high probability of choosing extreme responses. So we'll give a one to this person. And those who responded less than 99 percentile will give a zero. This, so the below table is how the data looks like in the data file. Um, every row is one observation because the sample size is 1,000. So in the data set, we have 1,000 rows. And for every column, it corresponds with the uh, order of the variable. So the first column is speedy, second column is lying, 
third column is careless, and fourth column is disabled, and the last column is extreme. If you look at the first person, this person said, I'm speedy, um, I told the truth, I was careless, I have more than two types of disability, my mean score ranked 99 percentile and higher. Then once we have all the indicators, we can go to the second step, estimate the LCE models. Just as I mentioned before, we'll start with the two, late, two classes LCE model, then three classes LCE model, four classes LCE model, and five class LCE model. When should we stop? We'll stop when the model becomes too complex to be useful. Because we have five indicators in our example, I'll stop at the five latent classes LCA model. I think it's already become too complex to be useful. Now we have in total only four, four models, two class, three class, four class, and five class. In M plus, we have to create individual syntax for individual models. So in total, we'll create four syntax files, four input files for these four LCA models. The steps to create M plus syntaxes well, the first step is to create a syntax for the two class LC model. Then make sure it can run properly. We'll use that as a template for us to create mod syntax files for the other models. Then we'll run all the rest of the syntaxes and get the output and figures. So what does the syntax file look like? This is the syntax file for a two latent class model. and M plus adopted a color differentiation system. So all the blue ones are commands, M plus commands. All the black ones are editable statements. I break this syntax file into three sections. The first section is title, data, and variable commands. Those are regular commands included in every M plus syntax file. So title tells M plus the title name of this syntax file is called Fixtures Latent Class Anal Analysis. Data tells M plus where to find the data. Before we run the, before we create this syntax file, we have to, um, we have to promise the data file is already ready to use. Then LCA exam called dot .csv is the path for that data file. Under var variable commands, we have different statements, names tells us the variable names included in the lcaexample.csv data file. Because in the data file, we don't have any names. Then in the user variables, it tells M plus which variables we're going to use for this analysis. Notice we didn't use the ID variable. So we can select whichever variable we're going to use in the current analysis. Categorical statement tells M plus what, um, which variables are categorical. Then the second part of the syntax is in the red boxes. These two statements tells M plus we're gonna do a LCA analysis. And remember I tell you this is a two latent class model. So where does it identify two? Here it is. And these two statements requested for the LCA model. The third part of the syntax is in orange boxes. This is where we requested for outputs uh, diagnostic statistics, uh, statistics. So remember, we requested for three things. First is a plot. Second is we saved a new data file, and we saved a variable. The third thing we requested is tag 11 and tag 14. These two will give us likelihood ratio test results for us to evaluate the models. Now we have the two latent class model syntax ready. We can run it, make sure it can run properly so it can serve as a template. Then how to make the syntax file for the three class LC model and other LC models. There are two places we need to change. First, we're gonna change these two into three. So it identifies a three class LC model. The next thing is we're going to save a new data file corresponding to this LC model. We call it lc3-save.txt. Only two places need to change. 
In this way, we can create syntax files for class, four class LC model, five class LC model. Once we have all the syntax files ready, we can run the syntax file and get the output. To um, new users of M plus, I will introduce the um, files that are connected with each LC model. There are four files. One file is the input file we just work on. It's the syntax file we use. We ha we'll have an output file, and we'll have a graph file, and a new data file. So the files in the red boxes are the files corresponding to the true class LCA model. You can see it's not very clear, but um, the graph file ended by .gh5, graph. Then input file ended by .int, input. The output file ended by .out, output file. Then we have the new data file, lc 2 cfttxt It's a new data file. It's included the original five variable data sets with other information we obtained from the uh, uh, LCA analysis. Now we have all the outputs. And because we have four models, we need to evaluate these four models and then decide which one is the best. So how many classes should we return? We're going to use a multiple statistical criteria. Uh, there are many ways we can um, decide the, which one is the best. But in this example, I used the four commonly used ones. Uh, I'll introduce them one by one. The first is the Bayes information criterion, also known as BIC. The second is sample size adjusted BIC, also known as ABIC. I put these two in one box because they both belong to the goodness of fate statistics. So we have four models. The model with the smallest BIC or the smallest ABIC will be our winner model based on this first and second criterion. Then the third and fourth are likelihood ratio test um, criterions. The first one is called low mendel robin likelihood ratio test, or we can call it LMR. The second is the bootstrap likelihood ratio test, or bootstrap LRT. This, I put them into a second box because those are both likelihood ratio tests, which compared a complex model and a simple model. So if the p-value of these two tests are significant, then the complex model wins. But if the p-value is not significant, then the simple model wins. Also, we need to consider interpretability when it's hard for us to decide which model we will finally keep. Let's look at our example. Where should we find the BIC and ABIC? So we'll go to the output file. For each model in the output file, under model fate information, we'll find the BIC and sample size of just the BIC, which is ABIC information. So this this uh, this this output file is the two class LCA model results, and here is a summary of the four models. It's very clear the two class model have the smallest BIC, and also have the smallest ABIC. So based on BIC and ABIC criterion, two class model is the best model. Then, where to find LMR, low mendel robin likelihood ratio test? Remember in the outputs, uh, when we write the syntax, we asked for TAC 11, TAC 14. So low LMR is under TAC technical 11 output from the output file. Um, the second box showed you where you can find it. So the p-value is less than 0.001. This is for the two class LC model results. And here is a summary. Let's just read this line. If we compare two class LCA model with one class LCA model, the p-value is less than 0.001, indicating two class model is better than one class model. If we look at all those rows in the cell, finally we'll come to a conclusion. The five class model is the best one based on the LMR um, criteria. Let's look at the next one, bootstrap LRT. So, Bootstrap LRT can be found in the output file in under technical 14 output. So in the second box, you'll find the results re regarding to this criterion. Uh, this is also the two class uh, LC model results. P-value is less than 0.01. And here is a summary. 
we can tell based on the bootstrap LRT, the two class actually is the best model. Now, which model is the best? Here is a summary. We have three criterion told us you sh we should keep the two-class model. And one criterion tells us we should compare, we should retain the five-class model. To me, five-class model is really hard for me to interpret. And also I have more criterion suggesting I should retain two-class model. Then I make a comprehensive decision. I'll choose the two-class LC model as my best solution. Once we have the best solution, We'll interpret the results regarding that model. Using the results, we can answer these four questions. Given a person belongs to a certain class, what is this person's probability of saying yes to each item? To give you an example, since we have two latent classes, given a person belongs to latent class one, what is this person's probability of being speedy? So the second question we can answer is, what should we label its latent class? We, we can call it latent class 1 or latent class 2, but it's not really meaningful. So we can answer the question, what should we label its latent class to give meaningful names to these two classes? The third question we can answer is, given a person's response pattern, what is the probability that the person belongs to a certain class? For example, we have five indicators if a person's response pattern is 11000, what is the probability that person belongs to latent class 1? What is the probability that person belongs to latent class 2? The fourth question, what is the sample size of each latent class? As I mentioned before, this is very, very important when we want to know the sample size of invalid respondents. So we can decide following steps to take. Then, where to find the results for these four questions? It's all, so for the first question, we can find answers in the output file. Under results in probability scale, M plus um, divided the two latent classes into two panels. The upper panel is the results for latent class one. The below panel is for latent class two. So if we are interested in the question, given a person belongs to latent class one, what is this person's probability of being speedy? We'll look at the first red box. Category 1 here is 0. Category 2 here is 1. So if we want to know the, the answer, I'll interpret the first red box. So students in latent class 1 has 97% probability of saying yes to speedy. Let's look at the second box. Students in latent class 2 only have 2% probability of being speedy. In this way, we can answer um, questions regarding other items like lying, careless, disabled, and extreme. We'll use the same output to answer the second question. Instead of just looking at one item, we need to look at all five items. So for latent class 1, Students have high probability of being speedy, being lying, being careless, being disabled, and being extreme. Or in general, students in latent class 1 have a high probability of being invalid. So I give them a name, invalid respondents. Let's look at latent class 2. Students in latent class 2 have low probability of being speedy, low probability of being lying, and all the other options. So I give them a name, honest respondent. For our third question, given the person's response pattern, what is the probability that a person belongs to a certain class? Remember, we, see, we requested M plus to produce three different kinds of results. So in order to answer this question, we need to go to the save data in the new, in the new data file. So on the right side, it showed us what is contained in the new data file. Remember in M plus, we don't have variable names. So I put the variable names ahead of the data set for you to understand. The first five columns corresponding to our original data set. At the end of the data set, there are three other columns, CP1, CP2, and latent class. If you pay attention to here, it's called C probability. 
This is corresponding to CP1 and CP2. It's called conditional probability. What is conditional probability? Conditional on your response pattern, the probability of being in class 1 or class 2. So give you an example. If we look at the first person's response, this person's response pattern is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. The person's probability of being latent class 1 is 3%. Based on this response pattern, the person's probability of belong to latent class 2 is 97%. Then, at the end of the data set, there is another variable called latent class that is based on the most likely class membership. So for the first person, 97 probability this person can be in latent class 2. So M plus categorize this person into category 2. And also, another thing we need to pay special attention is because we choose two class LCA model as our best solution. And here we can see a very clear classification of the classes. There are some circumstances, maybe for CP1, it is 0.5, and CP2, it is also 0.5. That tells us that model doesn't work really good. We should find a better model. And also, because we use the two class LCA model as our final solution, so we have CP1 and CP2, what if we have three classes LCA model as our best solution? We'll have three columns, CP1, CP2, CP3, followed by the latent class variable. So let's go to our last question. What is the sample size of each latent class? So here is the data set, the newly received data set. Based on CP1, CP2, we can have a way of calculating sample size. Based on the latent class variable, we can have a second way of computing sample size. So the first way is based on the estimated model. We just need to add up all those probabilities. So if we add up the first column, we'll know the sample size for the first class. And if we add up the second column, CP2, we'll get the sample size for the second class. The second way of computing sample size for the latent class is based on the latent class variable because it is, uh, it is computed using the most likely class membership. So we just need to do run the descriptive statistics to get it. Let's look at the numbers. Using the first way, um, 38.00541 people will be grouped in the invalid respondents group. We need to pay special attention because these are not integers, meaning some people got break into two classes. And using the second way, 39 people are classified into the invalid respondents group. So the numbers are pretty close. Now let's move to the next thing. Should we do an intervention? Should we do some sensitivity analysis? To my data, 4% is within my tolerance. So I decided to include these people. If you are not really unsure if you should include it or not include it, you can do a sensitivity analysis comparing results of including those people and excluding those people. Also, remember we use 1,000 observations as the sample size. If you have 10,000, this might be like 400 people are invalid respondents. The sample size is big enough for us to do follow-up surveys or interviews to investigate why those people don't want to give us honest opinions. Are they not interested in the survey? Or do they didn't realize the importance of the survey? So we can give some intervention targeting those people. I love this one because it's integrated everything in one plot. It might be really hard for you to see the numbers because I get it from the um, M plus um, figure file, but you can always uh, have the you can always have the information and uh, create your own file in Excel. I will introduce this figure. On the this name, the name of the figure is called item probability files. This is for the two class latent class model, and the x axis is the items corresponding to the item order, the y-axis is the probability. 
it actually integrates the information from these two tables. The first part is the information we needed to answer the first and second question. So the red line is class one, latent class one. The blue line is latent class two. And the dots on each line, I can give an interpretation. So b given the student belongs to latent class one, what is the probability of students responding yes to Speedy? Or given a, a student belongs to latent class two, what is the probability of this person being Speedy? And also look at the line accordingly. We can give labels to each latent class. Another um, additional information from this figure is we can tell descriptively LC, this two class LCA model actually do a great job classifying people into a clear two groups. There's no overlapping, no mix. And the information in the box is the proportion of sample size. So how to get the item probability profile plot? I spent some time to, to investigate it, to get it, so I just create four steps for you guys, so it's very easy to follow. The first step is you open the output file and click the diagram icon, then a new window pop up. Select the third choice, sample proportions and estimated probabilities. Click view, then a, window, a new window pop up, Let's select the plot estimated probability only. Click finish. The last step tells M plus which category we are interested in. In the current example, I'm interested in category two, seeing yes, being speedy, being invalid. So I select category two here. And then we'll click OK. We'll get the plot. What does a bad model look like? I choose a three class LCA model to show us what a bad model looks like in the plots. You can see very clear here. For these two classes, they are mixed together. There are overlappings, and it's really hard for us to differentiate those people. So this model doesn't really do a good job to help us. Okay, I introduced the theoretical part. I also thought like introduce the step-by-step -step M plus illustration. And I think using all the, uh, all the introduced information, you should be able to apply LCA in your own research. So the following part will be three tips. The first thing is, we have the latent classes variable saved in the new data set. How can we use it? We can just treat it as a categorical variable, use it as a dependent variable, like an example, we can use gender and race to predict the class membership. A research question can be, can we use gender and race to predict the probability of being a valid respondent? Because we have two classes in this variable, we can use binary logistic regression. Or we can choose the else latent classes variable as a dependent variable. Uh, independent variable to predict other outcome variables, such as self-efficacy. We can introduce more, uh, more covariates in the model, like gender or race, because um, remember, in the estimated LCA model, a person is not, in many cases, a person is not 100% classified into a group. You might have 96% into class one and 4% into lesson class two, but you can't break this, people, this person into two parts. So there are some errors when you use the latent classes variable. Um, methodologists have suggested to introduce covariates in the model to make it more accurate, like here, gender and race. And I provided the syntaxes for those models in M+, which is one line, very easy. Second tip, troubleshooting. So using M plus, sometimes it's really frustrates is you have one error then you can't make the model run. And the common thing I meet with 
doing LCA in M plus is the bootstrap likelihood ratio test. The model can still run, but it provided us with a warning. So to get the bootstrap LRT, we use the tag 14 here. And the warning looks like this. I have the p-value related to this bootstrap likelihood ratio test, but the warning is I need to increase the number of random starts using the LRT starts option. Where is the LRT starts option? It's hiding under type equal to mix, under analysis command. And the default number is 0, 0, 40, and 8. What does that mean? The output file gives us some hints. So 0, 0 is the random starts specification for the key minus 1 class model. And 48 and 8 is for the random starts specification for the key class model for generating data. So the warning tells us the 40 and 8 are too small. You need to increase these two numbers, which I did. I increased them to 320. In reality, first I increased them to 0, 0, 120. I still get the warning. So I continue increasing them now to 0, 0, 320. Now, the new output. Number changes into 0, 0, 320. And I got the p-value for the bootstrap likelihood ratio test, and I didn't get any warning message. So I can trust this information. Yay, third thing. Things to keep in mind when doing LCA. LCA classifies people, not items, into unseen subgroups. I just want this thing is not in your head after this talk. Second thing is, a large data set is required for us to do LCA preferably about 1,000. Just imagine if you only have 100 people. Classifying them into unseen subgroups will introduce lots, lots of errors in it. Third, with many indicators, please consider the full version of M+, because M+, demo has a lot of the uh, restraints. I know it's very expensive to buy M+, account. It costs almost $1,000, but in, um, in ITC 151, we have two computers installed with the full version of M+, and it's freely accessible to students and faculty. Then the last piece, there are also some other softwares to complete LCA analysis, like Litten Gold, Pro LCA in SAS program, and Per LCA in R. Ta-da! Useful information. <laughs> As per of Mutant 2012, this paper introduces how to use TAC11 and TAC14 for us to test the number of latent classes. It also gives us some tips when you meet problems, how to troubleshoot them. So the part I introduced troubleshooting is based upon these notes. The second paper, Densen Inc. Okay, if you really want to be a savvy LCA researcher, Please read this paper. This paper introduces you with more criterions you can use to, eva to evaluate the LCA models. It also uses st statistical tests to evaluate the performance of the LCA model. The third reference is, is also an introduction to latent class analysis with an example, but it uses a different software. It uses the latent gold. If you are interested in latent gold, doing LCA, then you can refer to this paper. The last piece is you, if you want to cite and reference my talk, here are some to-go information. Okay, this is the end of my talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.